thought there wouldn't be any better place to start than just by getting you to tell us a bit about yourself and your journey so far. Um, and how did you become interested in archaeology in the first instance? Sure. Um, well, I am a assistant professor at the University of Colorado, and I am an archaeologist and I study the ancient Maya and I direct a project in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. Um, I have a bit of an unusual background, perhaps. Uh, I'm part of the first generation in my family to attend college. Uh, my mother didn't finish high school. Her father was illiterate. Um, and my family has had a number of struggles. Uh, but I've been fortunate that I was able to go to college uh, and go to grad school uh, and eventually earn a PhD. And I've always been interested in the past, um, which seems to be all around us and in different ways. Uh, and when I went to college, I thought that I was going to be a history major, uh, but I started taking courses in archeology span and I realized how interesting it was to work with stuff, with objects. And I also realized that for me personally, being able to work outside, uh, dig holes in the ground was actually much more fun than uh, perhaps spending times in archives. Uh, so uh, it really sort of came together as a uh, interesting and fun way to be able to study the past. So from that, uh, those physical things, how are we able to understand both what's happened in the past um, but also what's happening now and potentially what could happen in the future. So uh, can archaeology help us to understand the social and political landscapes of countries and continents in 2020? Yes, absolutely. Um, so in terms of the past, archaeology is the only way to learn about what happened in human history before the advent of writing. Uh, writing first emerges about 5,000 years ago, uh, even later uh, in some places of the world. So if you want to understand what happened before the advent of writing, uh, you need to use archaeology. But I would say that its, it's use is not limited to the past, and archaeology is actually very democratizing. Um, and that even once people started writing and keeping historical records, there are many people who either could not write or who were not written about and whose lives are not captured in our sources, in written sources. Uh, as an example, here in the United States, uh, there's a booming field of plantation archaeology where oftentimes uh, enslaved individuals uh, prior to the 1860s were not, uh, could not write, were not written about but we still want to know about their daily lives and what life was like for them. Um, so we can rely on archaeology to sort of look at facets of life uh, that are not always recorded. And I would also say in terms of the present that archaeology provides a useful check on written sources and what people say. Um, this might be uh, perhaps not a surprise, but what people write down and what people tell you uh, can be incorrect. Uh, it's not always factually accurate. Um, there's a wonderful example of a project in the United States where researchers were interested in learning more about consumption, pattern, consumption patterns and sort of what ends up in landfills, what's recycled and how this process works. They initially sent individuals to households in a community and interviewed people asking them, what do you buy? What do you dispose of? How much do you recycle? Um, and there were questions like, how much alcohol do you drink in a week? And um, all sorts of rather personal questions. Uh, and they took the answers down. Archaeologists then came in and collected these individuals' trash and compared what the trash told us with what their answers were. Uh, and it turns out people were telling the interviewers what they wanted to hear. Uh, and they were reducing the amount of alcohol that they said they drank in a week. Uh, they said that they recycled much more than they actually did. Um, and so archaeology can sort of provide this uh, useful check. Um, and then in terms of the future, 
uh, there are really strong ties between archaeology and politics. And oftentimes, for example, uh, when rulers, be they kings, uh, queens, prime ministers, presidents, whatever it might be, want to justify their authority and legitimize uh, their place in the world, they often look to the past and use the past as a means to say, I deserve to be here. Um, this is the correct order of things. Look at the way things occurred in the past. So there actually is this strong tie uh, between uh, sort of using the past to justify uh, the present and especially sort of inequality in the present. A, a lot of your teaching and research, I believe you're going to teach a, a course on this next, is it next year on community archaeology? Yes. Um, for those who aren't aware and those who are watching, um, what does community archaeology entail? Um, and from that, I'd really like to kind of talk a bit about your project in Punta Laguna. Yes, of course. So uh, community archaeology is archaeology done with, by, and for local groups. Oftentimes, these are the descendants of the people you're studying. So, for example, with me, um, I do community archaeology with contemporary Maya peoples to help understand the ancient Maya. And archaeology has a problematic past. Uh, oftentimes, archaeologists have come into foreign places uh, and sought to sort of understand the past without consulting local people, uh, and too often simply taken artifacts out uh, and brought them back to their home countries. Um, and we're really trying to rectify this, uh, and we're trying to create a situation in which local peoples are uh, important partners in archaeological research, where we actually work together to try to figure out what questions we should be asking, where we should be digging, how we should be interpreting the results. But in my own work, I try to take this one step further and actually do archaeology in a way that benefits uh, local peoples and that benefits marginalized groups. So the idea is to try to transform archaeology from a uh, its unfortunate colonial past into something that uh, can help ameliorate inequality in the present. In, in, in instances where you are only working off of small fragments, um, how do you go about kind of avoiding jumping to the wrong conclusions? I'm not sure if that makes sense, but for example, if maybe in kind of centuries uh, time, if those people then were excavating our stuff, I guess, um, and they picked out a a Motorola or a Nokia phone, which no one uses anymore, uh, how would they go about kind of realizing that everyone else used iPhones, for example? Um, so one of the things that you'd probably be able to see is change over time in certain artifacts. So when we look at, uh, think of clothing, for example, uh, clothing from the 1800s, the 1850s, the 1900s, the 1950s, and the 2000s, is very different. And if you were to see uh, an image of a person dressed in a particular way, you might be able to offer a reasonably good guess of when they lived. Um, I know oftentimes you can even do this on a smaller scale in terms of decades and clothing in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. And you can see this change in fashion trends over time. Uh, it's similar with cell phones, where you can see over time this transition from these large bulky things that we don't even recognize anymore to the sort of flip phones, razor phones, and ultimately to the iPhones that most of us have today. And you can see this in ceramics as well, where there are changes in the sort of types of ceramics that are popular, just like fashion or technology. The shapes change, uh, the types of decoration change, the colors that are used change. And you can sort of see this over time in these shifting preferences and shifting styles. And so it's actually interesting if you're able to excavate uh, enough, you'd probably be able to detect and say in these lower layers further back, you have these giant cell phones. In the middle layers, you have these flip phones and razor phones. And then at the very top, most recently, you have iPhones. And so you'd actually be able to see this sort of change over time in the soil levels.
in that way, do you think that maybe retro fashion styles, where we bring back things that were kind of fashionable in the past, maybe messes with archaeologists a little bit? A little bit. Um, so do heirlooms. Uh, that's the other thing you have to be careful of, where sometimes people keep an object that is particularly important to them for an extended period of time, uh, and then they end up with this object that was actually made perhaps 100 years ago, and they still have it. Um, and that can actually mess with archaeological interpretation as well. Yeah, so there are uh, two sort of main things that we do. Uh, the first is survey, and this is non-invasive. Uh, it's above the ground. We don't disturb anything. And the idea is you have a piece of land. Oftentimes it's densely vegetated uh, in the Yucatan Peninsula. Uh, the jungle is pretty dense, so it's really hard to know what's there. And the idea is that you walk through a landscape and you try to note any features that are present. And then you can sort of describe them, photograph them, draw them and make a map to get a better understanding of what's there. Once you've done that, you can actually start excavation. Um, and this is digging square holes in the ground, uh, oftentimes using trowels, uh, sometimes shovels, sometimes brushes, depending on how fragile uh, the context is. Um, we're pulling out any artifacts that you might find uh, and then replacing the dirt. Uh, you can then take the artifacts back to a lab where you wash them, uh, catalog them, measure them, weigh them, uh, and then do your best to interpret some sort of story or narrative about the past based on these sort of small fragments that remain. Um, so survey and excavation are sort of the two primary methods uh, that we use. Hmm, that's a hard question. I would say uh, we found a stone bead um, it had, so it was a, a square, almost shaped like a, a playing die. Um, it had a hole through the center so that you could run a string through it. Uh, and it was inscribed uh, with a design on the side. And this would have been simply a piece of jewelry. Um, it wasn't functional, it was decorative. And this is, would have been like a pendant that somebody would have worn on their necklace. And it's a small thing, but that's sort of what I mean about finding these little bits of humanity in the past and just thinking that uh, over a thousand years ago, this is, was somebody's necklace and like this was the pendant that they wore around. Um, it was really sort of uh, gets to you on a different level. Um, we found other things, you know, pieces of jade that are perhaps more valuable in terms of sort of monetary or rarity. But finding this sort of bead, this stone bead pendant that would have been part of a necklace, um, for me, was really meaningful. Mm -hmm.